Welcome everyone and thank you for coming. Today I'm going to talk a little bit about the two people pictured in this photograph, Margaret Wiley and Arthur Calvin Millette. Then I will use the clothing they are wearing in this photograph along with some samples from notable costume collections such as the Metropolitan Museum of Art and the LA County Museum of Art to describe the typical fashion of the 1860s. At the end of the talk, I encourage you to take a look at the pieces on display from our very own costume collection, the Sage Collection. The Wiley House was inhabited by Wileys for nearly 80 years. Andrew Wiley, the most well-known Wiley for being the first president of Indiana University, built the house in 1835 and lived there with his wife Margaret and 10 of their 12 children. He is pictured on the far left. Theophilus A. Wiley, pictured in the center, was Andrew Wiley's first cousin, and his family lived in the house from 1859 until 1913. Theophilus was married to Rebecca Dennis Wiley in 1838. Together they had eight children, including their daughter Margaret, pictured here. Margaret and Andrew married in 1866 and welcomed four sons, Theophilus, Charles, Arthur, and Joshua. Margaret Wiley Millette was born on August 6th in the year of 1843. She was the third child of Theophilus and Rebecca Dennis Wiley. She was 16 years old when she and her family moved into the Wiley House. She and Arthur met when he boarded at the Wiley House. The Wiley House is located next door to where this talk is taking place. If you haven't had the opportunity to visit, I highly suggest taking a tour. Arthur was educated at Indiana and eventually attended Indiana University in Bloomington. He entered law school at the university, but his studies were interrupted by the Civil War. After the war, Millett finished his studies at the university and attained a law degree in 1866. Shortly after graduation, on May 23, 1866, he married Margaret, otherwise known as Maggie. They moved to Muncie, Indiana, where they began their married life together. Through a series of events, Arthur Millette was elected the first governor of the state of South Dakota. Shortly after he left office, it was discovered that the state treasurer had stolen much of the state treasury. Millette, although not personally responsible, gave up his entire fortune and all of his property except for his law library to replace the stolen funds. Let's begin talking about fashion and dress of the mid-19th century, starting at the top and working our way down. The hairstyle pictured here is very typical of the mid-19th century. Women wore a middle part hairstyle with a low chignon braided or held in a net. Hair a la peritrice was a new hairstyle of the time that was popularized by the Empress Eugenie in 1853. Hair was, quote, folded back over softly rounded pads from a center parting to reveal the temples and ears. Sometimes, flowers and ribbons decorated the side and back of this style. The necklines of mid-19th century day dresses were quite modest. The narrow collars, often made of lace, muslin, or cambric, was used to vary the appearance of a dress from day to day. The Sage Collection has provided examples of these collars which can be viewed after the talk. Similar to the interchangeable collars, 1860s dresses also had interchangeable bodices, a daytime one and an evening one. Some bodices were, quote, tight-fitting, closed at the neck and buttoning down the front. Some were a jacket bodice with basques, which is characterized by an extension which flared out at the hips, while others, quote, still preserved descending pleats from the shoulders to the pointed waist. Based on this description, which bodice is Margaret wearing? The daytime bodice was characterized by long sleeves and a high neck opening, whereas the evening bodice was cut low over the shoulders and with short sleeves. Based on this description, is Margaret wearing a daytime or evening dress? This time period is also noted for the extreme slope of the shoulders, which is more clearly noticeable from behind. We began seeing this style as early as the 1840s, but it continued for several decades. This sloping effect was created by the arm sigh, the opening to which the sleeve is attached to the bodice, circling the upper arm horizontally at armpit height. Armholes were placed very low to create this bottleneck shoulder effect. During this time, in fact, it was desirable for women's shoulders to reflect the, quote, smoothly sloped look of the top of a bottle. 
As you can imagine, this greatly inhibited a woman's range of motion. Two types of sleeves dominated during this time, the pagoda sleeve and the bishop sleeve. In the 1850s, the pagoda sleeve dominated with its shorter, wider shape that, quote, reinforced the impression of dresses expanding and opening. On the other hand, as time moved closer to the 1860s, sleeves became more tapered, and the close-fitting bishop sleeve with a curve at the elbow dominated women's fashion. Throughout much of fashion history, there is an infatuation with women's waists. The 1860s were no exception. Although the women were given a little more breathing room with the Basque bodice, which included less boning to cinch in the waist. This was probably acceptable since the waist still appeared quite small next to the enormous width of the fashionable skirts. The Basque bodice was often worn over a waistcoat or with the chemisette, which is similar to a camisole. This style is the predecessor to the tailored suit, the idea originating as a dress with a matching jacket, and it was introduced by Charles Worth, a notable dressmaker who designed for Empress Eugenie. One source I consulted said, quote, even remote areas in America would eventually feel the influence of this man, which of course is illustrated quite beautifully by this picture of Margaret in our very own Bloomington, Indiana. The ever-increasing width of the skirt was the clear focal point of fashion during this time. The enormous width of the skirt served two purposes. One, it demanded attention, and two, it tried but failed to maintain the fashionable's elite status. A contemporary comment is illuminating. Quote, Perhaps it is a spirit of exclusiveness that has induced the leaders of fashion to surround themselves with barriers barriers of barrage and other similar outworks to keep the common herd at arm's length, or rather at petticoat's breadth." Unquote. As the skirt grew fuller, a new support system was needed and the cage crinoline was introduced. It seems whenever I discuss fashion history, it is the undergarments that people are most enthusiastic about discussing, most notably the corsets and cage crinolines. Perhaps it is the novelty of these garments and our inability to fathom what it must have been like to wear such garments. Unless, of course, you are Kim Kardashian, who is trying to bring back the waist trainer, which is essentially a modern-day corset. Apparently, people in the mid-19th century also enjoyed discussing the topic. Quote, the crinoline was the principal topic of social discussion, provoking admiration, abuse, ridicule, and moral disapproval. Before the cage crinoline, women wore multiple layers of petticoats to create the wide skirt silhouette. Whereas many women were happy to be rid of the excessive weight of the petticoats, the cage crinolines had their disadvantages as well. In one story, quote, a youthful duchess rushing, rushing over a stile caught a hoop of her cage in it and went head over heels, lightning on her feet and her cage and whole petticoats remaining above her head. They say there was never such a thing seen, and the other ladies hardly knew whether to be thankful or not that part of her underclothing consisted in a pair of scarlet tartan knickerbockers, the things Charlie shoots in, which were revealed to the view of the world in general." Unquote. My favorite quote about the topic came from a book by fashion historian Valerie Cumming, Quote, that the fashion had disadvantages was a minor consideration. The thing would sway about in the breeze, exposing ankles and more. Mounting stairs in front of a gentleman was an embarrassment, sitting down a revelation. And yet, were such moments wholly without thrills? This discovery that woman was, after all, a biped, supplied her with weapons too long neglected. Speaking of woman as a biped, let's discuss shoes of the mid-19th century. Although Margaret's shoes are not visible in this photograph, we can draw some conclusions about what she was probably wearing. Women of this time wore low-heeled ankle boots. We saw low heels added to women's boots and shoes for the first time in the 1850s, the height of which rose to about two and a half inches by the 1860s. These boots often had a military look to them. With that, let's move on to men's fashion of the period. By the late 80, 1850s, men's clothing were reflecting that of women's clothes with a more relaxed fit with their loosely cut coats and trousers. 
Generally speaking, shoes that buttoned and laced were more fashionable than boots for street wear. Specifically, there were three common shoe styles, the brogan, the gaiter, and the, quote, everyday shoe, for which I couldn't find a name. The everyday shoe featured a square toe and small heel. Footwear for work was commonly made of waxed calf skin, goat skin, and kid, which is a soft, supple leather. For evening, men wore gaiters also called spring-sided congress gaiter, which had an elastic side. Gaiters were made of light calf skin and made all in one piece of material. And finally, brogans had a larger heel and were the standard shoe issued by the military. However, in the fashionable world, low boots were more popular than brogans. An interesting note about shoes, factories produced shoes that came in rights and lefts. Shoes made by hand were usually no-handed, but if the wearer never changed the shoes from one foot to the other, they would become rights or lefts. Whereas women's undergarments consisted of petticoats, crinolines, corsets, chemises, and drawers, camisole tops and combination camisoles and drawers and corset covers, Men's undergarments were neither as varied nor as interesting. Men's undergarments often consisted of a shirt with a detachable collar, quite like that of the variable collar of the women's bodice, and drawers. Drawers served the function of underpants. Sometimes a man would tuck his drawers into his socks to, keep, to help keep his socks up. Shirts usually buttoned only partway down with about three buttons. Both men and women minimized the amount of skin shown during this time period, thus men would generally keep their shirts buttoned unless at really strenuous labor. Knit undergarments resembled long endwear of today, but instead of elastic, it included button closures. Men's pants had two different names depending on how they were made. If they were made by a tailor, they were called trousers. If they were made in a factory, they were called pants. Pants or trousers would have a button fly, as the modern zipper was not invented until the 20th century. You might also notice these pants do not have a crease down the front center. Creases did not become popular until the 1890s. As is typical with fashion trends, styles of coats were distinguished by the formality. In earlier decades, tails were appropriate daytime dress. However, this style would soon be exclusively for formal evening wear. The frock coat quickly replaced tails as the go-to for formal daytime wear, distinguished by its slimmer skirt and overall looser fit. In addition, frock coats were characterized with multiple pockets, including one or two breast pockets on the inside, two pockets in the tails, and sometimes even pockets on the outside. Sack coats, on the other hand, mainly just had pockets on the outside, and they may or may not have included flaps. Coats were commonly made of wool, cotton, and linen. Silk and superfine wool broadcloth were used for more formal, formal garments, whereas wool of tweed in check or plaid patterns were usually used for everyday attire. In comparison to women's fashion, men's clothing maintained a basic shape and rarely changed. Quote, only small details marked the passage of time. This is relatively true in today's fashions as well. Vests were also referred to as waistcoats. As you can see from these examples, the flamboyance of the early part of the 19th century vanished in favor of more subtle colors and patterns. For example, patterned waistcoats would have a tone-on-tone -tone effect such as white embroidery on a white background. Unlike the fashions of today, vests were cut straight across the bottom. Low-cut vests were worn with evening wear, whereas high-cut vests were worn with everyday attire. Waistcoats were commonly made from worsted wool or silk for more formal occasions. Men wore different styles of vests for day wear and formal occasions. Most vests featured a shawl collar, lapels, and three pockets. Single-breasted vests could be worn with either single or double-breasted coats, but a double-breasted vest was only worn with a double-breasted coat. Maintaining the more subtle look of the 1860s as compared to previous decades, cravats and ties were not as long or colorful as before the 1860s. Colors included black, white, or a color that contrasted or complemented the rest of the outfit. 
white ties were reserved for more formal occasions and were worn with formal evening vests. Black ties were reserved for informal summer vests. Regardless of formality, ties and cravats were made of silk, satin, or anything of a silky feel. The width of the cravat would depend on the type of shirt worn. High collars, with high collars, a man would wear a wide cravat, whereas with turned down collars, a man would wear a narrower cravat. Ties were tied in a variety of ways, except for the modern bow tie. The double Windsor knot, known today, appeared during this time. You might be surprised to find out that pre-tied cravats were available at the time. They fastened with a tie, buckle, button, or a spring steel coil. With no facial hair to speak of, Mr. Millet was surprisingly clean-cut for the time period. Long hair, full side whiskers, big mustaches, and beards were all quite popular in the mid-19th century. Abraham Lincoln had what was known as the Puritan hairstyle, with no mustache, but with sideburns that attached to a short beard. As pictured in this photograph of Millette, men's hair in the 1860s was cut to ear level in the back, parted on the side, and combed back into a smooth style. Hair held its shape through the use of kinds of waxes and oils. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to my talk on mid-19th century fashion as it related to the Wiley family. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to email me at hastya at indiana.edu.